uh, we have an opportunity for council interest, a planning uh, update, the zoning ordinance rewrite discussion, and George Holm will, will lead that discussion. And then I think it's Peter Chapman's first uh, presentation for the council today, and he will give an update on development moving forward. And then at uh, 6.30, I will present to you the FY2016 uh, proposed budget. Okay. Mayor, members of council, um, this will probably be a regular and iterative update that we have uh, every few months on where we are with the uh, four school development process. Um, just as a, a reminder about where we've been, of course, that we, you know, we reviewed and negotiated and, and, and developed this package of four schools um, and that when we agreed to the comprehensive agreement um, in October and, and it was ultimately executed in December, um, that at that time, uh, the, the school designs were at 35 percent, um, and this is a significant shift for us in how we're doing procurement of major public facilities to move from design, bid, and then build, that we're in the, we're in the design build um, scenario, and it offers the opportunity for us to shift the risk to the developer, but it also offers us flexibility as we move along, um, and we we are informed by the bidding that actually goes on once the plans get to 100%, where we have just arrived at this month for the four schools um, to, to continue to make adjustments to the project. As a reminder, we had, um, as part of the... Ron, did you say you're at 100%? We are now at 100%, yes, sir. <clears throat> the, when we were looking at the, the, all the proposers and then ultimately negotiating uh, with S.B. Ballard, we had this over this collaborative joint senior team from both the school system uh, and the city that was the PPEA review team. But as we moved from the agreement of the comprehensive, comprehensive agreement, um, this will just give you a sense here on the right, the pre-construction meetings where we actually had the actual uh, managers that are, are vested with certain items, whether they're on the city or in the school system, uh, for example, whether it's whether it's stormwater issues, we have that that staff involved, or if it's IT for the schools um, or the kitchen selection equipment for for schools, both the facilities manager and actually the project managers who uh, work on maintenance. All throughout this, particularly over the past year, uh, starting in March of, in twenty fourteen and really culminating this past month with a lot of significant input, including the principals that were previous, some, in some cases at each school, previous principals and the current principals of, of understanding what we're doing. We also collaboratively uh, looked at, so that we're not having schools that are singularly, um, have a different set of door handles or furniture or the, or the computers, looking for some standardization across there um, and making sure that we stay within the, the package that, that we have. I'm happy to report that to date we're, we're under construction for two schools. Um, mostly what we're doing for, you know about Camp Estella, we had a groundbreaking for Bowling Elementary. Um, mostly what we're doing right now at, at Bowling is site work and you'll start to see uh, actual construction in, in the upcoming months. Um, this time next year we'll have the next two schools um, under construction as well. Uh, we continue to remain uh, on time uh, for all development that's con uh, considered, whether it's the design uh, and or the construction for all four schools at this time. Uh, one key part of this PPEA comprehensive agreement uh, and or doing a design build is that we agreed to a guaranteed maximum price. Uh, typically, uh, we had the situation where in in previous facilities where we have design bid build and you have the uh, low bids and we have, would accept that contractor based on low bid and it is pretty common that change orders would happen and that, that, that perhaps the scope of the project may escalate. This is not the case in this scenario. Again, we shifted the risk to the developer at 35% conceptual design, uh, construction designs. Um, we agreed to, you have to build the school at, at, at this spec uh, and, and, this, and this schedule and at this budget. Um, what we have in here that, that we do have uh, the ability to manage is some contingency um, and through our, the, the general agreement of the, of the comprehensive agreement, the contingency part does have the opportunity for the developer if there are unforeseen situations, such as if you, you, 
during your land disturbance, you run into the things that weren't known. Um, that, that, that if it wasn't, wasn't in design and construction uh, previously, then the contingency be used. But we're trying to be prudent in making sure that we have the ability uh, for, if there are owner requests, additional items to be added, um, that that contingency can be used. And, I, and I'll highlight some of those uh, in a minute. Um, also note that we, you know, we use that the, the comprehensive agreement uh, for the construction and finishing that design from 35% to 100% is at the 101, but don't ever want to lose sight of that we did have about 4.6 million just over that in the previous uh, design and also demolition of Camp Estella. So it's really about a $106 million project. <laughs> Additionally, um, if there are savings, 100% of them accrue back to the city. Um, realistically, with what this authorization we have, though, uh, we know that this is an appropriate use for what we need to, uh, to have for all four schools. I want to uh, talk through, through this for a minute because um, there was some, uh, some discussion that was out there. So when, as you recall, in October and November of this past fall, um, from what we had previously planned for what we thought the, the, the budgets might be for the schools um, until what we agreed to in the conference agreement, we had about $10 million of gap to close, to, to look at the difference in, in what, what could we really um, accomplish and what was, was feasible. We agreed to, as part of um, as the comprehensive agreement, um, consideration for this, some people call this value engineering, we're calling it best value management here, some consideration um, of changes in three, basically three buckets. A different approach to engineering, um, public and recreational amenities, uh, and then architectural accents. And that was about two and a half, two point two million dollars uh, that we agreed to that uh, some would be uh, accepted right away and others would be left pending depending on where we end up uh, with construction pricing and where our contingency is as the, as the, uh, uh, the project uh, progresses. I'll give you a couple examples, for, for example, at Camp Estella that, and, and how we're and why this design build process is a good process to work in. Uh, we looked at the initial 35% uh, construction drawings. We were looking at a certain type of foundation. Um, and once we had uh, moved to 100% construction uh, drawings, we actually uh, had structural engineers that certified a different approach that gave us savings to the project. We also ran into some dirt that, um, dirty dirt for lack of a better term, that uh, we didn't expect. And so we had an extra cost of, of about sixty to 90000 I think we're still getting that final bill there. Um, and so that is the type of scenarios that we, we've run into, um, and it all, all comes back into the project. Again, from the outset, we did, we did decide on some items that just, um, in order to make sure that we could get that 101, 100, and $1 million package, uh, we decided some items that, that made sense. Sometimes you can over-engineer something, or there are just different approaches depending on what, archi uh, what architects uh, that you're working with. And so we accepted some. And these are, that I've put here on the board, basically the, some of the, we, we went all the way down to something that cost $5,000. We were really looking at the change in the cushion, so to speak, as, as far as what is, what is really necessary to deliver a first-class facility and for the educational programming and make sure that's in the project. And you know, we had a long discussion about um, in the fall about what's the capacity. We wanted to make sure we had the capacity for now and capacity in the future. And we also wanted first class facility. So the, there are differences in, in approaches in architecture and engineering and that's what we worked through. And that's what we have here. We've accepted some. So changing, for example, the service yard in the back from uh, concrete to asphalt. Uh, those are some. Uh, you were very clear to us, um, and at the time when we were at 35% drawings, uh, we looked at the fact that we didn't have the large second floor bathrooms on the, on the, the three K-5 schools. And, you, and you, you directed us to make sure that those were included based on, on the public input and the, and the input from the school system. And so we, we thought at, at one point it was over a million dollars. Once we got to 100%, we saw how much uh, it actually is, and, and we've already uh, Remove that from the from the uh, best value management list. We're building the, the bathrooms on there. Um, we looked at modifying um, certain the way rebar goes in in certain places, and the the, the pricing came out good. And it wasn't necessary to do uh, to redesign something different than what we had. So we went ahead and, and took that out. 
Uh, we changed, we had savings in changing the doors. Uh, the architect had, had suggested the door locks be a certain way, but the school system actually has a preferred door lock, and we're using that one. So there were savings, again, that, that was an alternative engineering uh, solution. We looked at um, the public and recreational amenities. Most of that comes, uh, obviously, at the end of the construction of the project. And so we have time, and we're looking for uh, uh, the alternatives we have there. Examples of the sidewalks. There, if you look at our best value management list, you will see a reduction by two feet. Well, that reduction by two feet of, of really hits on two different sizes. One is sidewalks from 12 to 10 feet, or sidewalks from 8 to 6 feet. Um, and then in some cases, we're also looking at retaining the actual 5-foot sidewalks that are there. So the new sidewalks we're putting back are either going to be double the size of the sidewalks that exist, or there will be somewhere in between. Right now, we don't have any changes uh, in there. It's just something that we're, we're working through. We're looking at pricing and as we, as we look at, at the, the exterior of the building. Um, other things that don't have to do with direct education of the students, we also are kind of holding back, looking at our contingency, and whether or not we, we can do that. We'll, we will make that decision before the school opens. But right now, we're holding back because it's more of a recreational or a public amenity that perhaps there's another source or a grant. But right now, we have the capacity to do it. We're just holding back from absolutely saying do it because it's not time to do that yet. And those examples include additional softball fields that aren't already existing or the fitness trail, which is not part of the, of the uh, PE program. And then there are some, some other approaches as well to architectural accents, which again, don't take away from the education or don't take away from the look of the building. Sometimes they're subjective input of architects and or uh, you know, individuals of what, what is appropriate for the building. So those really are the three buckets, and that's how, that's how we manage through it. Um, we are committed to delivering a package of schools that everyone will be proud of. We do work very collaboratively. Um, as you see, that list of meet meetings that we have with the school system, they are our client. Um, sometimes we have to make tough decisions because we are managing to a budget, um, and, uh, but it's a budget that gives us the ability to deliver first-class facilities. Um, and so that's, that's what we have for this evening, and we'll continue to give you the updates um, as you request. Um, Camp Estella, obviously, we're starting to see that's going vertical. Um, we started back in the gym in uh, cafeteria area, and you see that it's um, it's, a, it's a significant facility. So. Yeah, cafeteria. Yeah. Um, Mr. Reddick, go ahead. Yeah. A couple, couple of things. Concrete versus asphalt over the years. When we, um, right now, we, every, you know, winter we have all the potholes. So over a period of time, uh, although we might be saving money at, on the front end, what's going to be the consequences on the back end? concrete we, do, we do look at maintenance uh, yes sir and 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 in that case that one I mentioned is a very small piece um, so we, okay. we believe that we understand what those outgoing costs are and in regards to wheelchairs uh, on your sidewalks are the sidewalks going to be able to accommodate wheelchairs if you reduce your sidewalks absolutely so we have to build to uh, ADA, ADA American okay. Defense, absolutely and so no less than five feet which right. are the existing sidewalks that are there okay um, so what we had was we over engineered a little bit looking right. at 12 foot wide sidewalks okay. in some places okay. um, and so we're we're gonna adjust but it is ample access for okay. the public and especially for ADA okay thank you Ron, um, when you say uh, modify this um, steel docking and joints tell me there was, it, it was just a matter of a, opinion about diff differences of engineering approaches to certain areas of the building. Um, and um, you or I, what, in walking into a building, wouldn't know it. In engineers, um, you know, look at a way of still achieving, giving you a floor wall, columns, and things of that nature, and there are different ways of doing it. The one that we had when we adopted the comprehensive agreement, it's, it's, it's no longer necessary. Um, we looked at the pricing. We looked at the alternative. It would have cost more to design the alternative than to accept the what we had in the design, and the pricing was good. Ron, Ron um, look, I don't think any of us knew know the difference between a 12 foot and a 10 foot sidewalk, or you know, I mean, eight or six. But on each of these, you know, on our what we were given, there are fitness trails, and I think. Before you start eliminating some of those things, like the fitness trail or the softball field, I think you need to come back to us to see, okay? I mean, and I think these monument signs, 
it creates a sense of place. I mean, those are make it, that's what it makes it special. I don't just because you're trying to get down some budget and you just you got to come back to us, okay? Before you start taking those important elements. And when you say modify fencing, I don't know if you're just if you what kind of fencing, what that means. But I, fencing is, you know, is I mean, it still creates a sense of. Whatever kind of fencing you're talking about, if you're just talking about going to a chain link fence that, someplace, and no, sir, not chain link. No. That sits across. I mean, okay, but I mean, but, I mean, you got to let us know. We've a lot of us have worked very hard on this thing, and uh, we want to make sure we get the product that we've actually talked to the community about. The fitness trails. Um, I know, like for instance, there was a big deal at, at a lot of people walk their kids to school, and they want to. Walk and then you know they use the trails. I mean, I know they do in Largemont and in places. <coughs> so and Angela's anxious. And Angela to wants to use it. So <laughs> and that one okay. that we're working through. We have a higher requirement than than what we had in the con in the package, and we're working through that. We were we prefer asphalt and under our own even ADA requirements, and so that that's what we're working through. Right? And, and I, I'm sorry I had to get mean at the last meeting. Well, maybe I'm not sorry about <coughs> this. Because it's exactly what Paul's saying. It, when these were presented to the community, it never said optional on the fitness trail. So do you understand why that becomes a big deal? Mm -hmm. Because there was really no controversy with the Ocean View School. Everybody who came to those town halls were happy, except for me with the bathroom situation. You know, nobody really said anything bad and nobody fought it. Because the way that it was presented with a softball field, with, you know, a, a t-ball field and two baseball fields and a fitness trail, people were left that meeting happy and excited about what's going to happen. So when you start picking those things off, then you got to go back to the community and say, oh, by the way, that fitness trail was optional. Now you get people that are angry yeah. because they thought that that was part of the package. Over a few but thousand in fairness, dollars. Though, to the contractor, he had the fitness trail which every other community. <coughs> my understanding of that letter that they sent would have accepted, which is like it's a mulch trail or whatever. And then our coach people are saying, no, you're not going to put that there. You're going to put a, you know, asphalt or special track. So well, we we're said telling trail, him he I has thought, to upgrade. But there's a trail out of Granby. I thought which is asphalt. When we said asphalt trail, I mean when we said trail, I thought you meant asphalt. Now, I don't I know what the or waste yourself, yeah. you know. Yeah. Well, I, 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 I think and, and I wouldn't have thought <coughs> about mulch at all. We, we no, I, I don't know, but okay. evidently that would okay. the point originally is a lot of these we, okay. we still haven't finished okay. the project. No, so, so but I, I think that's where the rumors start coming out, which Mamie heard it, and I think Terry's heard them too. There are people who are talking because they're hearing that things are getting cut. We haven't been updated on this in a long time. Uh, I mean, it's been a while. I think really since the 35% meeting. And so we haven't heard what has happened since then or changes that have happened to the project. You know, and on the school side, with <coughs> my contacts there, yes, they have their issues and there's been some transition with administration there, but still, where's the line where the school should still be involved if you do remove a fitness trail right. that should the school system still know that that because maybe the physical education coordinator was planning some curriculum or mm -hmm. things around that fitness trail even though it's not an educational thing and it's not in there maybe because they were aware that that was coming that they were starting to make plans for that trail so I, I think the school system out of respect to them should continue to be involved and I think it needs to go beyond Steve Smith. I know he's the the coordinate the, the project manager on that side, but I think there needs to be other meetings with Dr. Thornton and yeah, other key do. people. We so. actually we actually are a regular agenda item on the school board school construction committee, and we give them written reports on this. That, um, so they're aware of what this proposal is right here. Yeah, these items have been discussed. <coughs> and that, are they in agreement? Some of the rumors started from two. Are they in agreement with so, what we're proposing right here? I'd, I'd be happy to talk to you. I don't know which which one. I mean, specifically. Um, 
But I think they also think that they don't have a say in this. So I think that might be part of the disconnect as well. A presentation's a presentation, but at some point, if the school board has a problem with something that's being removed, then we've got to figure out a way to make sure that that's communicated properly to us so that we're aware that there's some discomfort with something being removed that they thought was going to be part of it. So that if we do need to fund it or we need to find an alternative, we need to be able to support and help that, not change, you know, major things. Right. Yeah. So, okay. so what we're proposing here is across the board, when the presentation or the updates are given to the school board and they look at this, we're presenting it as here's what <clears throat> we're considering for all of the schools. Uh, we actually get more specific than that um, for each individual school. Okay. The, yeah, month, the monthly report is more specific. Apply to all of the uh, these are, yes, these are in general. Yes. Okay. Hey, Ron, um, when you talk about the fences, fencing, I think about crossroads and how pretty that is. Mm -hmm. uh, is, that, is that how we're going to accomplish that on all of these schools? Because no. you said something about maybe having to downgrade the fences. I uh, know what I meant by mono. The modification uh, in part looks, uh, there's a couple of items. Um, one of it looks at whether or not we, uh, we can do brick columns in some of them mm -hmm. or not. And so the, the, to take the best value management would be not brick columns, but just to do you know, the, the black wrought iron looking yeah, but aluminum. No, I'm, I'm expecting crossroads. Yeah. Okay. And you know okay. what that is. Yes, and, so and, that, that's what I'm expecting. And, and let me come back to that. The bar. Yeah. Large bond, for instance, sits right on Hampton. Right. And we moved the school back away from Hampton So we put a monument sign there, as well as we built this really nice fence because, you know, you move the athletic <coughs> up to the front. Right. And so that was the idea to keep the kids and the balls and everything. But also, I mean, it added some integrity to the, I mean, to the sense of, right. of place. I mean, and, and these and um, the, the brick selections, I don't know exactly what you yeah. mean by modify that. That's my but question. Some of these buildings are big. Campus Noah is big. Right. You know, they came there and actually broke up the facade with some of these lines in the brick selections, the accent lines. And, you know, it looks, I mean, Campus Tele, for instance, is really big. Yep. It looks, some of the early comments were about how industrial it looked. And we softened it with some of these architectural features. And, and I know even at Largemont, for instance, and um, there were there was some concern about how blank the, some of the walls looked. And right. some of these little features mean a lot. It may not be big ticket items, but they mean a lot to the building. And so before you start doing that, those of us who have been in the community and uh, I mean, um, you gotta bring it back to this market. It's okay, Ron. I mean sure. that's okay. I'm sorry, Terry. Go that's ahead. okay. Um, I had a couple of things. First to follow up on Paul, what do you mean by modifying brick? Um, Is that it depends color? on which schools and, and it's the size. Um, or the color. So this will be a complete brick, though, not half brick? Correct. And I, I was confused because, as you know, there was much dissension at Larchmont about the design of the building and, and, and uh, some of the common space. And they had been calling me about it, and I said, don't worry, we're going to come back to you before the final design. Well, now I hear that we have had, we do have the final design. So has anybody been back to the parents at Larchmont, you know, the group that was anxious about the natatorium and all of that? Well, what we agreed when we, the night we did the briefing on the conference of agreement, and it's right. in the project, is to use the music and that music suite and have a flexible room. So everybody's whole on that. That was the input they gave, and that's what we accepted <clears throat> in the project. Okay. Yes. Around a smaller bricks, bricks seems like you take more bricks. Um, yes, specifically in Larchmont, though, if you look at the, that brick size, it is it is not. Um, it it is a very narrow profile, and we're we're looking at. Uh, so to you're going to use a smaller brick at Larchmont potentially. Okay, yes. Good. So what um, what happened to Camp Allen? <laughs> it's, 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 uh, it's in the yeah, I heard it's that in our budget. In the We're going to push on through that. It's in the proposed budget. It's in next year's budget. One of the, the things that, that Ron said 
uh, mayor, members of council. And we actually had, a, 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 I think, a very good conversation with the chairman of the school board today, as well as the uh, chair of the construction committee. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it's very clear that uh, two things have occurred. There has been a great deal of collaboration with the school administration and the city administration step by step going through this. We basically, as I, I spoke with uh, Dr. Houston today, is the school <coughs> system is, is a client, just like the, we build a library. We have the library system and sitting at the table, just like the courthouse. So what we discovered in, in our discussion today is that maybe just the way things have been communicated back may not necessarily have been as thorough as, as we've had this discussion tonight. So we're committed, as Ron said, to uh, we even offered to go brief the school board, uh, but they thought that the construction committee was the better place to be. But as you said earlier, we're not going to make significant <coughs> decisions in this process without coming back to you because we understand that softball fields, trails are very, very important. <coughs> If the best value um, management, what we have proposed here, we're saying that the school system is aware of these proposed changes or pending um, what I'm seeing here. The, the school board is aware and they're on board. I don't know about the school board, okay. um, but we, we do who? get into the individual. At the construction committee, we talk through those and, um, and we have a, a report. Um, the the contract that the superintendent co-signed did include the list of, of value engineering items that are under consideration. Okay. Number two, back to what Mr. Riddick was saying about what the expectations are based on crossroads. And that's the rumor, and I don't know, Tommy, if you heard it, that's the one of the rumor that is... Uh, being talked about in the general public. What is presented at crossroads, the public is uh, thinking the sense of that's what the expectations will be for all of the schools that we're building. That, that is in the discussion in the community. However, the rumor is now that um, the principals as well as some people being involved are being told, and I don't know where that part, if there's a breakdown in communication, that the expectations of what is presented at Crossroads will not be the same level for our new schools as far as everybody having the opportunity to pick, for example, you gave with the columns and, and things like that at Crossroads, that you may have to use a different material or something like that. Is that what you were saying, Ron? When, I, meant, when I mentioned columns, I was talking about something you we you wouldn't actually see actually the okay. actual construction, not not finishes or materials. Okay. And then you said what is presented here is a general idea of what may be taken off or pending, but you also said that each individual school has its own makeup within this best value management. Mm -hmm. So I would like to see the breakdown for all the schools, what the best value management and what the changes um, would be, what's pending and what's not taken. Mm -hmm. I think that's what we might want to look at here sure. and compare it to this general best value management. I agree. I, 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 that's a great suggestion to see exactly what um, you, know, you guys are proposing. The only thing that I, I agree with the mayor and that, you know, you can't really, please don't go making these changes without letting us know because you guys are not the ones that fall on the sword for it. Um, but also, we are looking at schools that we're going to have around for a very long time. So we really want to make sure that whatever we put in terms of materials and finishes and things like that, that we're, that they are durable. Um, I get annoyed with rumors, and a lot of times they start from people who are working on committees, talking to other people, talking to people, and stories just get told. Once it get 
gets retold over and over and over again. It just takes on a life of its own and it doesn't sound anything like, you know, the actual truth. I don't know how we can put the story out there that, you know, the quality of the materials is not going to suffer. There may be some changes, but the changes are things that would make each school unique so that they're not all just simply cookie cutters. Um, that, you know, these are the things that we are going to change. And some of the engineering things, as long as the school is stable and it doesn't fall apart, if the engineering, if the engineering people say it's okay, who am I to question what they say? But the other thing when it comes to aesthetics and and soccer fields and walking trails, even though I don't walk yet, Terry. Um, I think we definitely we can't cut those things out without, you know, going back to the community, especially when we have all the things that we have now, talking about fitness and talking about being healthy and all that jazz. There, there is a, a stigma with city-built schools compared to schools that were built by the school system. So that's also driving some of this because some of the schools that they're having maintenance issues with were done by the city years ago and there were corners that were cut because of value, best value management. And now 30, 40 years later, those schools are having to deal with those maintenance issues, which although we give the school system $3 million a year in CIP, they need like 20 million. So to deal with these issues, and I'm experiencing that right now in my building, and my building was a city-built building, um, and there were corners that were cut, and we're facing those issues now uh, with HVAC systems and things like that. We just want to make sure, and I'm not saying that's going to happen here. It was too small the day it opened. Right, yeah. I mean, and, you know, there were some schools where that same thing happened, where you end up cutting a gym off. And, you know, and now they're dealing with a smaller gym, and it doesn't meet those requirements. So it is a concern, you know, because uh, and my kids are at one of these schools, you know, that's going to be built, and I have concerns about what they have to, you know, deal with down the road. Um, and I think some, you know, we, we should be asking these questions right now. I think, too, that just the information lapse is big. We, we really need to stay on this. This is too big of an expense for us as a city to not be kept updated on this on a regular basis, even if it's just quick memos. I know you got a lot on your plate, but I think it's too big. We it's have a much what? smarter and brighter and forward-thinking council than they had 40 years ago. Oh, yeah. Oh, 40 years Notice ago. she said 40 years. 40 years ago. No, Paul's first year. <laughs> that was Paul's first year. <laughs> uh, Marcus, we expect these buildings to stand in the test of time, obviously. I mean, certainly the community wants us to be good stewards of their money, too. And I know there's a fine line you have to walk. Okay? I mean, we want the best value for, for the buck. For sure, and I know you're trying to do that too. But, 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 I mean, there are things that we talk to the public about, and the public wanted, and you know, and it will. That'll be our legacy, right? So, and we're not going to let it happen. Okay. Right. Are there any council interests, Mr. Riddick? Uh, yes. <clears throat> I tell you, um, my grandmother used to say, "Every time I hear from home, it's worse." <laughs> and uh, I guess, you know, who thought it could get any worse than the fellow in North Charleston you know, being shot down? And then we have a retired insurance executive who rides along with the police department and ends up killing a guy because he thought he had his taser in his hand. <clears throat> and so, based on the uh, South Carolina incident, uh, and we had an incident that the chief confirmed the other day that the camera was on when we were taught that it wasn't on, uh, <clears throat> <I'm, clears throat> I don't think this council should accept any excuses. If something happens and a camera's not on and it ends in, you know, fatality, uh, I think about some of the incidents we've had over the years and the different Commonwealth attorneys that said they were justifiable homicides. And, and now I question those, uh, and, and this is just me personally, because I have been uh, sensitive to these police shootings 
since a fellow by the name of Lama Spotleroy was shot down in 76 in the police lockup, going into the police lockup, handcuffed behind his back, shot six times, and it was considered a justifiable homicide. So I think it should be some type of penalty to a police officer who gets into an incident and it says that he forgot to cut his camera on, and not forgot to cut it on, but somehow dis disarmed, because I think it comes on automatically. Uh, and I hope this is still the case. When we entered, uh, we started using tasers in Norfolk. The officers kept the tasers on one side and the revolvers on the other side. So I'm hoping that's the same thing. And uh, that, you know, you're not going to have your taser on the same side you have your service revolver. Uh, because, and when they, we put them in, it, they were done that way to prevent, you know, those type of accidents. Uh, a couple of the things that I <clears throat> that I had uh, as far as traffic is concerned, uh, and I talked to the chief about it uh, on Lexington Street. There's a high rate of speed in the 900, 800 block of uh, Lexington Street, and also some of my neighbors on Johnson Avenue who don't want to go to Church Street, they go down Johnson Avenue the wrong way to O'Keefe Street to you know to access O'Keefe Street. So, uh, and I do see the. Uh, the motorcycle officers coming through the neighborhood. So for those are things I'd like for us to look at. Sure. Mr. Webb. I got a couple of things, and I, <clears throat> I know the chief and the manager have been alerted about some some issues at the Prentland Library. Yes. Are we on top of that? Yes. So, that's, a, that's a very, uh, that's a heavily used facility, and we need to make people feel comfortable when they're there. Uh, the other thing, and I see my friend over here, Mike, uh, that requested that we uh, with all union dues out of pay, um, is there? I just like to get a, an idea of whether, why, or why not we wouldn't do that. Um, it seems to be doesn't seem to be a particularly difficult accounting thing, I don't think. But um, I mean, if you have a good reason, but I, I would think if we could help out, it would be to your advantage. Um, the last thing is with the emergence of these breweries and local. Uh, they're now selling growlers, the big 40-some ounce, in some of these convenience stores. And we're, I know one of them, uh, Mr. Miller, the owner of Miller Park, <coughs> called and said they had a problem at Old Dominion where they're now saying that that's not, that's a single serve and you can't do that. If, I mean, they're like 15 or $17. I don't, I don't really think that's something that should fall in our these micro brews, so, but we need to look at that. I don't, I don't think everybody needs should have to come back and apply for a special exception. I think that's above and beyond, at least in my mind, what what's involved with the single serve. So can we look at that and try to make make it easy on our uh, store operators to, to not have to reapply and go through that process? Because I really don't. I think that's not intended on single serve because we're kind of morphed into or evolved into another beer market here. Yeah. We could put an ounce limit on the single serve if it was an eight ounce, sixteen ounce or whatever. Or whatever the I think it's like the thirty two ounce or something yeah, that we're trying to get away from. There, and I, how much is, how much is in a growl? I don't know. I don't know. Well, growl. Let us get you that information because yeah, we're gonna yeah. we're gonna be running out of time here pretty soon. Can we'll I just say one thing Marcus yes. um, uh, in regards to uh, taking out the dues for you know, the uh, fraternal law, whatever yeah. you need to do. Um, I think it does create another layer uh, of bookkeeping. And so who's to say if, if um, fraternities and sororities or masons or elks said that they wanted their dues taken out? Uh, I'm opposed to that. Uh, I'm opposed to that. So let's look at both sides. Okay. Of it. Huge difference between the police department and elks. Man, it's... We're not going to argue with yeah. that. Gonna... Yeah. That all worked. Very quickly, we got a letter from Mary Jane Hall asking us all to nominate uh, citizens for the jury committee, I believe it was. There's no phone number on that letter, so I didn't know how to call her, but I have no <coughs> idea what the responsibilities are or who they're looking for and yeah. what they would be doing. So I'm happy to nominate people, but if you could give me some information. Once a month to evaluate people that want to get, because I nominated three or four last year, to evaluate people who want to get out of jury duty, and they make the call. Uh -huh. We need good people in that then. <laughs> okay, and then just very quickly, Tommy kind of broached on it, but I was going to bring this up. 
I think it would be very helpful for us as council people, at least me, if we got from you all just a quick summary of all these projects, deadlines, what's been met. I mean, I, I didn't know that we were 100% at design. Maybe that was my ear. Maybe I wasn't catching up on that. But I, I'm not asking for a long presentation. I'm not asking for a treatise on it. Just quick summary, once a week even, you could put it in of where we are, what me benchmarks we've met. It's hard for us to keep up. I know it's hard for you. That's it. Thank you. Amy? Just to say, um, Sister Cities, the French delegation is coming to Richard Bowling Elementary on April 20th um, to do a presentation on geography, so um, at 4.30. Um, so you're all invited. Um, and then they're, they're going to come out with the big delegation on April 22nd um, to do some activities with the children dealing with language arts, music, and, and dance. So you're more than welcome to come out and, and see what we have planned. Um, Norfolk Public Schools is to meet with us next week. Um, my question is concerning the agenda. Who sets the agenda? They you'll, do. you'll tell me what you'd like to talk about. Okay. Well, my question is on the agenda, if it's going to address the citizens' concerns, ideas, suggestions, and recommendations as far as what has been happening in Norfolk Public Schools. Um, whether it be finance, whether it's the, the new superintendent, um, whether it's um, what's happening in Norfolk Public Schools, where are we now, where are we going in the future, um, those type of things. And the other one is how soon will the council receive a copy of the uh, joint meeting between us? Do we receive it the day of? Can we receive it? Um, the agenda? The agenda, yes. Do we receive it um, the day of? Can we receive it a day or two prior to our meeting with Norfolk Public Schools so that we can um, look over it and maybe even be prepared for um, some comments to Norfolk Public Schools? Will this setup be more of Norfolk Public Schools giving us a report, just a simple report, or will there be conversation going on, some discussion? as far as the city and Norfolk Public Schools. Because last time it was more of a presentation, um, but we also have to consider um, and address the concerns of the citizens as far as Norfolk Public Schools is concerned. So we can definitely have the agenda out for you in your Friday packet. Okay. And as we get questions, about topics from the council, we'll add that to the agenda and have it circulated before we send it out. One nice thing, we're going to meet start at four o'clock at that work time, right? and there's nothing else on the agenda, so it's not like we're pushing up against you know, another <coughs> item. So we we can take all the time we need. It's not we'll anything you want to ask today. Three of you have all the time you need to work. You can go an hour, you can go three hours, four hours. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have <laughs> a couple of things. Um, Park Maley um, over at, I was with the <coughs> Puffball Civic League, and um, a couple of them with repaving on Duck Pond Road. Um, there's a huge manhole dip thing that I think was paved at one point and it's like starting, not starting to sink, it's already in the ground sinking, so there's a huge thing there. And then um, in the 700 block of Bayberry Lane, um, standing water and falling trees. And I don't, I don't know that it's not on private, that it is on private property or isn't on private property, but if we could take a look at it, because um, from what I understand, the standing water excuse me, is causing the tree roots to buckle or whatever tree roots do, and that's cause, causing the trees to, um, to fall. And then um, to all the staff members here who participated with um, Principal for a day, it was yeah. a couple weeks ago, I think, and, and um, it was really a great opportunity to um, see what the, um, what principals go through, what the 
public schools are like. And um, I walked away again with a great appreciation for the teachers and the principals. Um, I was over at Coleman Place, but also just really happy that I wasn't a kid anymore. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, but that was a great opportunity. And so I encourage anybody um, who's interested next year, because the Norfolk Education Foundation does it every year. So um, I encourage you to do principal for a day. Um, maybe Marcus can give some comp time for it or something. Oh, oh good. Yay. Okay. And it was right. good. It was really nice. Vice Mayor. Yeah. It was very nice was. to be principal um, yeah. for a day, as well as there are some great things going over at the um, Norfolk Technical Center. Um, they're hiring children who are still in school from uh, the shipyard, starting off at $15 an hour, full benefits and everything. So that really um, impressed me. And there are some great things going over there to prepare our children to go world class. So just go. And another thank you to Green Readers. We did the oh, Green yeah, Readers. Uh -huh. uh, shout out to the telecommunicators. They're celebrating the good works that they do. So congratulations to, to you all. So it was really nice. I had a good time. That was all I I'll oh, be. I'm sorry. Go I've got one more thing. I do want to say to the chief, I really appreciate how quickly um, he handled the COVID situation, um, how um, how you kept us updated on it, and how quickly you all were able to investigate and come to a conclusion and act on it. I think it sent, um, I've heard very positive comments about the positive message that it sent um, to the community as far as the standards and the values. And, um, you know, I think I can say, I understand that you're one person and all of those people are extensions of you and us. And so if you set the tone, the leadership, the body of of your police force is going to represent the, the leadership and I think you did a great job in setting the tone for what is expected and um, what you will allow and what will not be tolerated by your officers so thank you I would like to get an update on the speeding on Ocean View Avenue I, I don't think anything's been done yet on it uh, maybe I'm mistaken but I did get another phone call complaint yesterday from another constituent about that um, radar in the, the radar boards, and then we need, may need to look at some traffic stuff out there down the road. Um, I know we don't budget much for new signals, but there may be a need as traffic's increased to start looking at uh, that as a calming device um, there. On the line resurfacing, or the line repainting, there is a section of Little Creek Road that's missing from Tidewater Drive to Chesapeake Boulevard. Um, basically everywhere from on Little Creek Road from Tidewater Drive down to Meadow Creek is missing lines. They're just completely gone. And as was discussed yesterday, probably with the sand, it acts like Richard was telling us it's like sandpaper, um, and it basically takes the paint off. And I think that we just have more areas that need it more than anything. Um, when Terry was bringing up about project updates, we have a CIP link on our website, uh, CIP projects. It doesn't look like it's been updated in about a year or so and maybe I know David you're new so you but there's a there's links to every project that's happening around the city and they seem outdated on there and also we used to have a project meter uh, link that it would tell you on the big projects like school construction where we were like which, uh, but yeah I don't know what happened to that maybe it was just in the transition of the website um, that would be great and I just wanted to put my little dig in about committees. I think some of the uh, things that we discussed today could be solved if we reestablished our council committees um, and we could discuss these types of things uh, in our committees like school construction and then talk about it as a council again. Hint, hint, Mayor. Committees can be grueling, but I think you're right. I think they're necessary. Yeah. And Marcus, if I yes. could just quickly say, uh, I use the wrong terminology, sororities, but other professional organizations similar to police unions. Okay. Marcus, just to build on some of the comments, by the way, what's happening with the construction of these schools is really 
I mean, we've never taken on a construction project like that. And to be where you are with all 100% now, Ron, and to be pushing, I mean, this is trying to, like, it's like hurting cats, I know. But, you know, I, I just appreciate all the good work that's been done so far. I want you to know that. But I think we're all going to be proud of the results. So, okay. Okay. zoning ordinance. Um, before I do, let me make sure that I remind you that um, Jeremy Sharp is the project manager, um, and <coughs> Jeremy, together with Lenny Newcomb and I, make up the project management team um, from the, the, the city staff on this project. Um, so what we want to do is talk about where we've been, where we are, and, and where we're going. Um, as I think we've talked with many of you, this project has um, the ability to transform Norfolk um, into an even more amazing place um, than it is, um, and that's part of what the button is all about, um, and we invite all of you to participate in the, the transformation. Um, this project got underway last summer. Uh, the uh, consultant team, led by Clarion and Associates, came to Norfolk. They interviewed um, dozens and dozens of people, um, interest groups, um, talked to, to you all, and from that, um, developed a series of themes uh, that going forward have formed the basis for the zoning ordinance assessment. So the themes, there, there are five themes. The first is to improve user friendliness. The second is to um, create regulations that make Norfolk a more resilient and sustainable city. The third is to recognize and support the distinct character differences in the city and, the di and its different context. Theme four is to modernize and customize the development standards. And theme five is to reduce the number of nonconformities. Um, they produced the, the, um, a, um, a zoning assessment. That assessment is available online. Um, if any of you would like a printed copy, um, we can uh, please let me know and we can arrange to do that for you. So quickly running through the themes, um, the first theme in improving user friendliness um, is essentially to create a, an intuitive structure, use pictures and graphs wherever we can, um, tables and charts as opposed to long uh, paragraphs of text, um, and design for electronic use. When we say design for electronic use, we're not talking about the iPhone, but we probably are talking about a tablet type of device um, that would, where it would be usable. Um, part of user friendliness would also include um, two items that we want to highlight. Um, in their proposal. The first is to require the use of neighborhood meetings, and I, use, and I carefully use the term neighborhood as opposed to civic league, um, to incorporate the comments and the, the, um, the feelings of the people who actually live around a project. Now, clearly, we wouldn't do this in every case, but for the major rezonings, um, and perhaps for some of the, the significant projects, this would become um, a, a de facto requirement. Before you could even submit the application, you would need to meet with the community um, and get their sense of whether, A, whether they would support the project, B, under what conditions, and C, to work out the, the, uh, the details before, it, the, before the developer spends a lot of money and gets committed to a single design um, and before it comes to the city um, where things, where, where lines begin to be drawn and things um, start to become contentious. Um, the other, question, yes, ma'am. Um, you said neighborhood meetings, but not civic league meetings. How does one go about getting a neighborhood meeting and are they still going to be required to meet? I mean, is the proposal that still requires to meet with the civic league? Um, and what happens if there's a complicated meeting? Right, right. So the, um, the concept, and this is really broad brush. I mean, we're, we're not down in the, the detail level yet. But the, the concept is that the developer would, coming to the city, finding out what the process is, would be able to obtain from the city a list of all of the property owners within a 1,500-foot radius of the project. Um, it would be up to the developer working with the city to find a location send out a letter, 
and invite all of the, those people to come and hear about from the developer, hear about the project. Um, and the idea is to start an interaction between the developer and the people who are most affected by it. Civic leagues, so as part of that list, all of the civic leagues that would be in that area would be added to the list, so they too would be invited as part of the... So the idea isn't to do away with the civic league um, interaction, but it's to broaden it to make sure that in those cases where you've got something that's sitting on a dividing line between two civic leagues, or maybe it's one block in and one civic league, the other civic league doesn't get feel like they're being ignored. And, and Angel, I, when, when we did the meeting, uh, when I came up last week, um, I discussed my concerns about hierarchy and neighborhoods and that there are some neighborhood groups that have formed just specifically to oppose a project and they act like that they trumped Trump a civic league and so that maybe as we go through this process we may need to clean up our civic league list and uh, what is a recognized group organization that uh, you know and, and then if you have a homeowners association that is inside a civic league boundaries they you know do they have a bigger voice than the civic league or should they be part of the civic league so I think they they understood that that is a bigger deal in our city because we have so many different organized groups and I always use Gen as an example that I never know who's in charge over there or who's uh, the group to listen to so there's you have a, there actually is only one group that speaks in Ken I, I will well, say that yeah. but it's not a civic group right. <laughs> but, there, but it isn't like there's also a civic right. group yeah. and business associations and things like that a task force yeah. okay um, I, I'm, I'm told I need to reel everybody in and, and run through this as quickly as I can. Um, obviously, we're going to be available to you all for questions um, as this process moves forward. So um, if I go through something too quickly and you want more detail, um, pick up the phone, call and ask, and we're glad to talk about it. So theme two, supporting resiliency. Um, one of the comments, one of, one of the, the concepts that we are, are talking about is designating areas where um, we want to encourage intensified growth. These are the areas that are the higher and drier portions of the city, the area where uh, we can create opportunities um, that, um, for uh, becoming uh, an urban center and, um, and, and that are resilient and they're design and designed to last uh, for more than, you know, the, the first foot or two of sea level rise. Um, and so that's part of... of what came out of the discussions with the Rockefeller Foundation, 100 Brazilian cities. Um, we want to make sure that we have, we strengthen tree protection. We want to make sure that um, housing options um, are um, well covered and um, to um, encourage that we take the, the great bones that we have and encourage redevelopment that is sensitive to the context um, of those great bones. On the third theme, supporting the character districts, um, as you know, we created three character districts. Uh, one of the things that we want to mention to you at this point is that the discussion has led us to think that we may need a fourth character district, one up along the bayfront that recognizes that, that urban beachfront um, community um, that exists up there that is actually different than the other parts of the city. And so, uh, Mr. Smeagol, Mr. Wynn, we will be wanting to talk to you all about um, how to go forward with that. Um, key among this is the, the proposal to cut the number of zoning districts by more than half um, so that we have less alphabet soup in the, the zoning ordinance. Um, the fourth theme um, is to uh, modernize the development standards. And as part of that, we want to talk about parking and landscaping and open space, um, fencing and lighting. And again, all of these we think would be tied to the character district. So there may be different standards depending on the, the character district. Um, and we also want to add neighborhood compatibility standards. Um, so a place like um, the, the neighborhood that, that Ms. Johnson and I walked in the other day, um, the zoning requirements actually require one thing, but that's actually not what the built environment looks like. And so the compatibility concept allows us to use the built environment as the model, not um, an arbitrary line that, that's dictated um, in a code. Um, finally, we want to um, refine the nonconformity 
uh, provisions to eliminate as many of the non-conforming um, uses and, and structures and, and uh, accessory structures as we possibly can. Um, those are the sorts of things that, that keep us, um, as, as Mr. Newcomb says, that's the thing that keeps him awake at night trying to figure out how to deal with all the non-conformities. Um, we've done, a, we did a lot of public outreach last week. Uh, we had a public listening session at the Chrysler. Um, we had an advisory committee meeting with the advisory committee. We met with a number of you all um, as your schedules permitted. There was a planning commission work session on Thursday. Um, and both the uh, public listening session and the planning commission meetings were, that were taped for broadcast um, as well as, as um, for being on YouTube. Um, we did, I think all of you have received this brochure, the executive summary. Um, we can make unlimited numbers of these copies available to each of you, not on the shiny paper, mind you, but we can, so if, if you want to take them out to task forces and civic league meetings and, and things like that, we also want to make ourselves available to each of you all um, to go out with you to task force and civic leagues and, and, and talk about this process um, and where we're headed. Next steps um, is now we're down to the drafting stage, um, and it's going to be done in three, three modules. The first is administration, which is the basic boilerplate. Um, the second will be the development <coughs> standards, um, and then finally the zoning districts and, and the use regulations. These will start coming out at about a three to four month intervals um, over the next year, and you all will have an opportunity to, to see them, um, and we will have, hopefully have an opportunity to talk to you about them. Um, we have a website. It's loaded with information. Um, it's, op it's an opportunity for um, people to comment uh, on where we are and what they would like to see in it. Um, and at this point, I would entertain any questions or sit down so Pete can get up here. Ron, I don't I mean, uh, George, I don't want to complicate this. I mean, the public outreach piece too much, but. I mean, who would conduct a meeting? Who would conduct a meeting? The developer or the civic league president, or who? I um, mean, the, the the neighborhood meeting we're talking about. Right. In theory, the, where we're at at the moment, the, the concept is the developer would conduct it before making an application. So the, the it's a it's a conversation between the developer and the community, and and not not the staff in the middle. Um, and would you have staff there? We would have staff there. Certainly staff from neighborhood development, perhaps staff from planning, but not to try to, to, yeah, to take over. Right. The staff will take notes, that type of stuff, so not the developer, not the... Yep. Okay. Any thoughts about that? Anybody? I'm not sure. I, I like that they're meeting with people, that developers are meeting with citizens about ideas um, without making application that leads to the city for what it is. There, I mean, there are a lot of people who have ideas. And, I mean, I, I think there would have to be guidelines yeah. that that say these are the things that they would have to cover. But I don't think they need to get into too many, too much detail because you know who shows up to most of these meetings are people who are against. <laughs> Projects not for it. It's very rare that you get the people that are for it. So I'm, I worry about. I, I, I expressed this in the meeting last week. I just worry about how that's contained and controlled. I don't want to limit citizen involvement, but I think you always have to be careful I, I with that because you have good 1500. projects that go I mean, forward. That's an intention, but sometimes in practice. But you know what? I do like the 1500 feet from wherever right. the development is to actually get the input of the people who are directly affected by it because a lot of times things do happen in neighborhoods and the people across the street may not go to the Civic League and they won't know what's going on or um, they don't get the letter. Not they don't get the letter, they don't read the letter. And, uh, <laughs> and so they don't know what's going on. And I like that, but I just, I would like that they made application to the city before they go out and, for lack of a better word, get the community's hopes up with something that they may or may not be able to deliver on or spur 
a ruckus in the community because it's something that they absolutely hate. And then we start getting letters and emails and stuff from about something that they haven't even made application with the city about. I, I, that's just, you know, those are two sides of the coin. So that's, but I like the 1500. I really like that part of it a lot. Well, we'll, we'll put that down on the list. It, it would be in a procedures manual how that would have to happen. And it, this isn't intended to supplant any of the existing processes. It just would be an additional one up at the, the very front. Do you have any cities that that works well in? As examples. The consultant mentioned some, and right now I can't remember what they are, but okay. we'll get that and we'll get it to you. Me a copy yes, ma'am. Ron, we're going to, we got 10 minutes. And um, would you really like to get started on time at 6.30 for Marcus, because I know that's where you So, Peter, we're going to give you a break. Okay? <laughs> we're going to push you to the next meeting, okay? Unless you insist. No, okay. I'm not going to insist. Okay. Yeah. All right. And because I know we probably have an audience up there, we already get started. Thanks for coming. Thanks for coming. Yeah, thanks anyway. I just